Hello, everyone. My name is Tracy McLeese, and I'm a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service at the National Conservation Training Center. Today, we have a great presentation for you. And here's Wendy Caldwell from the Monarch Joint Venture to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. My name is Wendy, as Tracy mentioned. I'm the coordinator of the Monarch Joint Venture, and I'm also joined by, by Cora, our communications specialist. And we're excited to bring you today's webinar about Southwestern Monarchs with presenter Gail Morris of the Southwest Monarch Study. Gail is the coordinator of the Southwest Monarch Study. She's a Monarch Watch conservation specialist, vice chair of the Monarch Butterfly Fund, and is also on the board of directors with the Central Arizona Butterfly Association. You may recall a, a recent paper co-authored by Gail on the status of the monarch population in Arizona that was published in 2015. And we look forward to hearing more about Gail's findings in this unique region. If any questions come up during Gail's presentation, Cora and I will be monitoring the chat box where we encourage you to enter your questions throughout the course of the webinar. Um, we'll have a question answer period at the end uh, as we track those questions and, and we'll hopefully address those at the end of the webinar. Um, Gail, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we look forward to sharing a lot of information here. Uh, as Wendy said, um, a lot of the information I'll be sharing from you is based on the findings of the Southwest Monarch Study. And our area includes the state of Arizona, and much of the, er the information will be based on some of our findings, but also Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, the deserts of California, uh, mainly outside of um, Palm Springs and Western Colorado. So one of the easy ways to look at some of our history is by looking at some of the migration maps and breeding maps available. Uh, when we go back to 2007, 2008, Journey North frequently uh, featured this map showing the difference between the eastern and western populations. And you'll notice that a significant portion of the southwest was in an area not considered a breeding area nor a significant migration area. Um, the Rockies were, uh, still looked significantly as a major divide. Um, and even in Fred Urquhart's early books, uh, there was little information. Uh, uh, later, when Bob Pyle was traveling, gathering data for his book on chasing monarchs, he came down the coast and eventually ended up in Arizona and noticed that monarchs uh, during the migration had a southerly flight direction, a bearing towards the south. And uh, Monarch Watch later changed their maps uh, reflecting his observations. In researching for our paper that was published, we also found additional early information uh, with Jim Brock and Richard Bailwitz in Butterflies of Southeast Arizona back in 1991. They quoted monarchs having a southerly heading during the migration. And Bailwitz later uh, provided us with information back to 1975 to 1984 with sightings around the state that turned out to still be some of the major breeding areas that we were able to locate. The Southwest Monarch Study itself actually began in 2003 by Chris Klein, who was the education director at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. Um, he, he was uh, instrumental in beginning the process with tags, uh, creating monarch training, around the state. Uh, he left the area around 2010 because of family concerns back to Ohio. And at that time, we reorganized and looked at what did we want to do here in the Southwest. We expanded some of our mission, which already included tagging and monitoring to monarch conservation. We became a 501c3 nonprofit and more recently became a partner with Monarch Joint Venture. We expanded our band, our, uh, our board, and um, also added a scientific advisory board with Dr. Ron Rutowski at ASU and Dr. Scott Morris, who later helped us with the statistics on our paper and has a major monarch habitat down in southeast Arizona. 
So the main focus at first of the Southwest Monarch Study was, of course, tagging monarchs and learning their migration destination. Most of the tagging events were in southeast Arizona, where there appears to be the largest density of monarchs each summer and fall. It was designed to be a citizen science project that could involve all ages. Uh, tagging workshops were set up with tagging protocols put in place. Uh, we taught people how to use nets, how to finger pick monarchs off flowers when it was appropriate. Um, how to hold the tags once they were on the monarchs. We stressed the need to gather permission to tag in locations that permits were required especially. Um, we don't have a habit of holding monarchs in any cages or collecting them to be tagged later. We tag them right at the time in the field and release them. We also found we needed to have safety practices for people, rattlesnakes are pretty popular out here in the densest monarch habitats, but also for monarch safety. We found that oftentimes there were still monarch larvae or pupae in the field during the migration, especially during times of the warm falls that we were experiencing. And as you can see in this photo, a tagger's shoe is right near uh, pupa. Uh, often out here in the grassy fields, monarchs would create their chrysalis right on the tall grasses in the area. So it was something we were always aware of, and we are very quick to cancel uh, tagging events if we know that this is occurring. So the other thing that's unique out here and across the entire southern United States is that we have both queens and monarchs, and they often are easily confused in the field. Uh, we have information on our website uh, to easily be able to tell the difference. And while there are many, the easiest to spot in the field for people tagging, of course, are the white dots in the orange on queens versus monarchs. Besides their flight also, which is different, where monarchs will glide and queens flap their wings far more. The Bamona distribution of queens, you can see, covers the southwest quite heavily and the southern tier in Arizona and New Mexico have um, higher densities of queens to be aware of. Since we see them in the field on milkweed, we need to train people the difference between those as well. And our typical monarch larva on the left with two sets of tentacles or filaments versus on the right our queen with three sets. So, these are some of the areas where uh, major tagging has taken place. And as I mentioned earlier, Arizona has the heaviest density because that's where the study was started. But we are definitely spreading out now into the other southwestern states. Through the help of Monarch Joint Venture, we were involved in workshops near the Reno area for two years. And that has become one of our biggest source of people tagging as well. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we were involved in a fish and wildlife workshop in Las Vegas as well. Uh, Utah uh, recently came up with some new information and tagging, and we have a great group in the northern part of the state uh, by Tucker Thompson and eight others who are growing large amounts of milkweed as well and actually getting Salt Lake City planting milkweed in their city parks. New Mexico continues to grow in taggers, and we're looking forward to gathering more information with people there, and even a little bit in Colorado and in California. Um, most of our study compo is composed of what we call wild monarchs, monarchs mi migrating through the area. But there are a few that were also farmed monarchs. The Desert Botanical Gardens in Phoenix for several years uh, had a fall exhibit of monarchs. And every Thursday, they would ship in new monarchs. And before they added them to their uh, area, where their containment area, they pulled off monarchs to do, tag with the public and release. And we were part of that. That is no longer um, in progress. It ended in 2010, but it gave us some valuable information. We also found that. Um, there are, we were able to tag more males than females. So overall, for our paper, we reported 12,088 monarchs tagged 
Uh, now we're up to a little over 14,000, close to 14,500, and about 475 people have tags. Uh, or been responsible for tags. They may have purchased tags and distributed them to several different people. Uh, wild monarchs were 7,809 uh, farmed at the time was 4,279. Uh, they were at 134 unique locations. Now, we went through and scrubbed our data. Not all the data was used if people did not have permission uh, to tag or if someone later removed their permission, um, we had to withdraw that. So we actually had to uh, discount over 1,000 tags from what we originally had. Okay, here's a map in Arizona specifically of uh, where our data came from. The blue squares were areas where monarchs were tagged. The red circles are monarch sightings without taggings that were documented. We superimposed it on a map of rivers, and you can see the close proximity to moisture uh, where we were able to find monarchs. When we tabulated all of our tags together, we added them by week, and you can see our peak migration uh, was just after the beginning of October. Um, throughout the end of September and through October are where monarchs heavily present in the uh, state of Arizona. They begin to appear in uh, notable numbers in the higher elevations, usually in July. And we can see them through uh, the end of November and in the lower deserts, sometimes all winter long, and we'll go into that in a little more detail. Uh, in a, in a few minutes. So these are some of our tagging recoveries. Um, as you can see in Nevada, bec uh, because of the interest in the Reno area, we were actually able to find um, more recoveries this year along the California coast. We have five in that area. Uh, one person from Nevada took the tags with her and actually tagged a monarch at her second home, and you can see that California to California recovery. In Arizona, um, most of our recoveries, as you can see, are going down to Mexico, uh, although from the southeast part of the state, some are going to the California coast. So it appears like we're having monarchs flying in both directions. Uh, New Mexico this year also, uh, we had a bending of the mo uh, migration towards the west. Uh, we had someone contact us about monarchs in her area, and she was lucky enough to tag one monarch that was recovered in Mexico this year. So, of course, the question comes up of why are we having sightings in California of monarchs tagged in southeast Arizona? So when we looked at our data, we saw that they didn't always occur every year. In 2008, there was one. 2010 one, and 2013 there were five, and they were all tagged in the same week. And in 2014 there were two, and again, tagged in the same week, almost the same location. So we, many of us are weather spotters for the National Weather Service. And after reading David Gibeault's papers um, on monarchs using thermals during the migration, we came up with a hypothesis to test that perhaps our wind direction uh, and the monarch's use of thermals could be influencing their migration direction. A significant event in Arizona every year and the Southwest in general is our North American monsoon. Normally our weather winds blow from the west to the east, but at the end of June, the wind shift, bringing moisture in from the south and southeast, blowing to the northwest. This is a time of new life in our desert areas where everything comes to life, almost daily rainstorms, and some of which are pretty severe in intensity and a lot of updraft winds over the mountain areas. Uh, the monsoon season lasts from June 15th to September 30th, um, and it is at its peak during the middle of that period. 
Here's an example of the wind map for September 13th, one of the times that we were having a flight going to California, some of our recoveries in that area. David Gibeau noted that monarchs will favor thermals when temperatures are warm on the ground, and they like to fly at around 1,000 feet. So what we did is we went and we accessed records from the National Weather Service through their soundings in Tucson, which was the closest place with weather soundings that set up a weather balloon to check the wind direction at different elevations. And we found a significant relationship at 1,000 feet when the winds were blowing. And you can see it on this uh, graph. When winds were blowing from the southeast with the arrow going towards the northwest, we had recoveries. When winds were coming from the northwest on that upper left quadrant blowing down to the southeast, we had monarch recoveries. The red dots are recovered monarchs. The gray dots are all the tagging that took place at that time. So by using Fisher's exact test, we were able to find that both wind direction and recoveries plus the fact we were getting multiple recoveries that were tagged on the same day flying to the same location were significant. So as citizen scientists, we started looking at other data to see if events were happening in the West like were happening further in the East. And Dr. Chip Taylor, of course, of uh, Monarch Watch, uh, has a uh, migration by sun angle, uh, peak migration, if you look on their website. And we took those numbers of, of latitudes and superimposed them on the southwest map. And so according to Dr. Chip Taylor, migration would begin when the noon sun angle is 56 to 57 degrees and ends at 46 to 47 degrees. And we wanted to see what would be happening here. So here is a graph of our findings. The red triangles are monarchs that flew to Mexico. The blue dots flew to the coast of California. Um, according to Dr. Chip Taylor, uh, peak migration was between 52 to 53 degrees, and that is where the heaviest density on this graph of red triangles are. So, Interestingly enough, uh, the time that most of our monarchs flew to the coast of California where the blue dots was in the one month prior to that predicted peak migration, and it was also the time of our monsoon winds. We also went and observed that the Grand Canyon National Park had a lot of monarchs. Um, every year, they were very predictable, early sightings in April and May. Uh, by July and August, uh, monarch populations became uh, advanced into the breeding areas. Asclepias severtus salata was extensive all over the park, and it wasn't unusual by August during the summer monsoons that had now stretched to the Grand Canyon after a light rainstorm to see monarchs fly out of the inner canyon down to the south rim. But by September, when the migration came through, monarchs were really scarce. This is at 7,000 feet. And most of the time, we found little activity. But we did find, if you were along the river, by a person marking observations along the Colorado River while they were river rafting, you can see significant sightings along uh, the Colorado feeding on seep willow and moving towards the west. And if you can note how late that date is, we're talking about the end of October to the beginning of November, there were still migration movements. So the monarchs appeared to take advantage of the warmer temperatures, which was closer to sea level near the bottom of the canyon where it was still warm, versus the higher elevations at 7,000 feet where temperatures were already cold. We are also able to observe other signs of the migration. Uh, the photo on the right uh, was on South Mountain, uh, where we have loose clustering of small numbers of monarchs. And if you look real close in the middle of that photo, there's a queen joining them. Um, 
We also found over 40 monarchs in Canelo, 150 in Parker along the Colorado River, and 80 in Lake Havasu. And here was an interesting thing we found. We found small groups of overwintering monarchs that would stay in Arizona. Um, Lake Havasu along the Colorado River, Parker, Yuma, Tucson in southeast Arizona, Phoenix in particular had a large number, uh, could be counted on every year finding these uh, small clustering. We also learned when we were visiting in Nevada that uh, Las Vegas occasionally has overwintering monarchs, and we've also seen documentation along Lake Mead. So there's much more to learn about these areas. Here is some information I'd like to share with you about one of these, um, the Rio Salado Habitat and Rest uh, Restoration Area in Phoenix, Arizona. This is located along the Salt River. You can see this thick banding of trees, and the monarchs every year appear in these trees, and numbers vary from as low as uh, six or seven to some years we were at 45 or 50. Uh, they would stay in Gooding Willows and Cottonwoods, uh, became their primary winter habitat. Uh, seep willow was their primary nectar on warm days. They would come out on the southern range of that area. We did some counts around the Phoenix area back in 2010 and 11, where you can see uh, monarchs were along the Salt River in Tempe. We call that Tempe Marsh, the Desert Botanical Gardens, and back at Rio Salado. And then a hard freeze hit. A hard freeze is when it's below 28 degrees for over six hours, and that severely affected the monarch population here. Um, as you can see, we lost the monarchs at Desert Botanical Gardens, which is labeled as DBG and Tempe Marsh, and yet those at Rio Salado were able to survive with the tree canopy available there. We worked with the city to add Asclepius subulata to the area, a native um, milkweed, and within the very first year, we had evidence of monarchs breeding in February and in um, a month later with monarch larvae. Uh, we usually tag these monarchs in December. We wait for them to settle in um, rather than scare them away when they first arrive in November and tag them so we could monitor their longevity as well as their activity. Using monarch larva monitoring uh, protocols, we also uh, monitor this habitat weekly. And interestingly, we did not see any breeding any other time until February, where monarchs began breeding at the beginning of the month and then laying eggs several weeks later, and you can see their full life cycle. Uh, most years at this location, we do not see breeding until February. There was only one year in 2012 where we had a warm spell in February. Um, and the beginning days, let me think, I think it was in January, my mistake there, and it reached to 82 or 83, and that triggered breeding. But all the other years since 2007 when we'd, we've monitored, it's always been the beginning of February that breeding will begin with no activity earlier. So that raises a question, could this area possibly be in diapause or uh, oligopause? And oligopause would have that shorter refractory period where it's warm for just a couple days and that's enough to trigger breeding and that's something we're still exploring. Monarchs in Arizona can be found in waterways frequently when our temperatures are high and humidity is very low. We've seen this at the Grand Canyon in southeast Arizona where this photo was taken, in the Chiricahuas. We've seen it in the Phoenix area. Our humidity in the state can sometimes drop as low as 2 and 3%. Um, and those are the times where we'll see uh, our monarchs clinging to water. So it's said that you can find monarchs every month of the year in Arizona, and that's very true. A lot of times people will say you have year-round monarchs, and it's true, but not in any one location. Monarchs can be found in the lower deserts in the fall, in the winter, and spring in most years, but they then leave for the summer months. Usually once it starts reaching 100, the monarchs will move out if they haven't sooner. 
and we'll find them in our higher elevations in spring and summer. Through tagging and monitoring around the state, we were able to identify breeding season nectar as well that was favored by monarchs. We all know that monarchs can lay eggs uh, before flowers are open on milkweeds. Um, and so we observed our data and came up with charts that are in our paper. To do so, we split Arizona into three different climate zones. Uh, the lower deserts in the yellow, the green would be the higher elevations from 3,500 feet to around 6,500 feet. And then the blue areas were 7,000 feet or above. And these are some of the uh, nectar sources used during the breeding season. Uh, we'll give you a link to our paper at the end of this presentation so you can access this if you are, if you are interested in any. Uh, we also did the same with migration nectar. We found in the higher elevations, rabbit brush was uh, most used as well as the common sunflower. But the Biden's labus was also heavily used where it was available in creeks and streams. Rabbit brush, as I mentioned, was uh, a major source um, in the higher elevations. This is at the Grand Canyon where you could usually find several monarchs nestled in the bushes. They have three different species. And we find that monarchs will almost follow a ribbon of rabbit brush all the way down from the higher elevations to they reach the lower ones. Uh, between rabbit brush and common sunflower, uh, they can cover the state. We also identified favorite milkweed, the Asclepia species, at the different elevations. Um, we have a unique situation here in Arizona where we have several what we would call evergreen milkweeds. When they are present in the lower elevations, they do not uh, die back during the winter months like others do in the higher elevation. And we were able to ident identify those and find those that were most favored by monarchs when they are in the area. Asclepius subulata as a host plant, um, I think came as a surprise to many people. This covers the lower deserts. We'll show you its range shortly. It's an evergreen and for a long time was not included in any papers that uh, listed milkweeds for the southwest as suitable for breeding. Uh, eggs are frequently laid on the flowers themselves or the soft green growth that appears seasonally in the spring and in the fall. Um, and monarch larvae usually will consume those first until they're large enough to move to the thicker stems. It's one of the most common plants in the southwest deserts. We find monarch larvae on them um, in September, in the fall, when the breeding monarchs first returned a month before the migration, and again in the spring. And this is the distribution I was mentioning to you a little bit ago. Uh, this is through SINET. SINET is the Env Environmental Information Network, um, and they have collections of collections, so you could research many different species and find their range. And the subulata has been found to have monarchs visiting not only in Arizona and Southern California and up to Las Vegas, but also through Northwest Mexico, where monarchs have been reported feeding on their flowers during the time of the migration. And as you can see here, it's a common desert landscape shrub, so it's not uncommon to visit a neighborhood grocery store and find monarchs and queens flying uh, when they are in season. Baum and Mueller um, last year published a study in the Great Plains showing a movement of reproductive monarchs that move south in August and September through their area, and their offspring would then join the main migration a month later. And we definitely see that in Arizona. We see that in the northern range. Uh, it was most notable uh, during the Wallow fires several years ago in Springerville, where normally that area would have monarchs all summer long, did not because of the fire in the area. But uh, uh, one month before the peak migration, 
they appeared and were able to get off one generation instead of the normal two to three in that area. Um, the Phoenix area, we get monarchs returning usually around August 30th, which is a very interesting phenomenon because our temperatures still here are 105 and 106 when they return laying eggs on milkweed throughout the area. But our data, as we showed to you earlier, also suggests that some of these monarchs may be migrating monarchs passing through on their way. We've heard a lot in the news about tropical milkweed, Asclepius curassavica. And uh, we know in Arizona that we do not have any known collections here in the state. Uh, it has not naturalized, uh, but is instead is irrigated garden specialty. Uh, it's very likely because of our dry climate so much of the year, they're not able to survive outside of a water source. We know a lot has been in the news about OE um, as an obligate protozoan parasite that infects monarch and queen butterflies. We're aware of Satterfield at Al's uh, uh, high levels of OE and overwintering monarchs breeding on uh, Curasavica in Texas. And we question whether our evergreen milkweeds that are always present here uh, would affect OE levels and, in general, how prevalent OE is in Arizona. We know in the east it should be under, the studies have shown that it's usually under 8%, in the west 30%, and in non-migratory areas in Florida, 70%. So we tested over 463 monarchs in five years. And of those, 4% of wild monarchs were infected. Uh, when they were infected, we found they were in the major breeding areas in southeast Arizona in Canelo. Or uh, last year, we actually found infected monarchs at the Grand Canyon, uh, where we had not in the previous years where we monitored there. Uh, we had a very small sample of farm monarchs. I believe it was under 20. Um, they were not the monarchs from the Desert Botanical Garden um, that we mentioned earlier, but instead were um, at events that we were able to test. And a higher percentage of those, 29% of those, were infected with OE. So the question arises always of why are our levels so low? And we have spent a lot of time talking to uh, monarch health about this, and we keep coming back to the question uh, through them is protozoas like water. Uh, we're talking about a very dry environment here in Arizona, and could that be uh, a limiting factor, or could perhaps our high temperatures also have an effect? We're, these are all questions. We don't know the answers, uh, but it's in progress of trying to understand. Cattle and milkweed, I think we all have questions about this that surface from time to time. In Arizona, Asclepius subverticillata is one of the most toxic milkweeds, and it's the most prevalent growing across the higher elevations. We are very fortunate to have wonderful relationships with several cattle ranchers who allow us to tag on their property. And as you can see, the cattle in the field on the upper left uh, when they left the area, we went in, and you can see the small green Asclepius subverticillata growing on the upper right. Uh, out here at that stage, it looks very much like grass, but the cattle leave it alone. Uh, later, it's kind of a delight to go in the fields because they will go through and chew all around it, and it's very easy to see where the monarch larvae and everything are, are on because those stands are usually left standing. Uh, we realize this is not uh, an official study. It's our observations in one location, but they have been reported at other locations as well. At the same ranch, they had a large amount of Biden's labus growing through the creek that runs through the area. Um, in the past, it had large amounts of this beautiful fall nectar that monarchs savor. But over recent years, cattle grazing in the area have, have uh, reduced the numbers considerably. 
So we worked with the ranch owners uh, to move their cattle for grazing to other locations based on the time of the year. And by doing this method, we were very successful this last fall with a large river of Bidens returning to the area and good numbers of monarchs in the uh, area as well. The ranchers joined us in tagging and enjoying what happened and assure us that this will be a new practice of theirs to stay. So there are ways to work around people um, who own cattle ranches, who depend on cattle for a living. And uh, we're hoping we can work with others to achieve the same results. At another location with Biden's Levis down at Aravaca Cienega, part of Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And you could see our photo in 2011. Um, this is a beautiful patch of Biden's. Um, every fall, it fills the river. And if you would take a step off that area of grass on the left into the river, you'd be up to your shoulders in water. But you can see the difference in four years to the photo at the right. Uh, the water level has dropped considerably. And by looking at this at first thought, you can easily think it could be a lower amount of rainfall. But to the contrary, the rain level in this area was actually higher the last two years. Uh, luckily, they have a retired uh, geologists and hydrologists in the area who are working to try to understand what is actually happening to cause this reduced number of uh, amount of water in the water table at this location. We do know that others have, um, uh, nearby areas have dug lakes to grow fish, and perhaps they're drawing the water table water to that area instead of here. They know it's a serious concern for the wildlife, however. So we continue to try to work with people in areas that are affecting the nectar uh, during the monarch migration. Oberhauser et al. Uh, wrote a great study on the effect of citizen science leading to conservation. And we are so fortunate to have many partners that we work with um, across the area to enhance monarch habitats. The, this photo is of the Phoenix Zoo this last Earth Day um, uh, asked for two monarch way station signs since they had uh, two areas developed and are working on more. We have partnerships with the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, Sky Island, Borderlands Restoration, uh, Make Way for Monarchs, and Signature Botanica uh, to create monarch habitats around the state. We have partnerships with Rio Salado and Arizona Audubon, Arizona State Parks. Uh, we are thrilled with the many organizations uh, and government organizations as well looking to enhance habitats for monarchs. Last month, we were involved in something that probably touched most of our hearts the deepest. Many of you likely heard about what we call the Tucson tragedy back five years ago when Representative Gabby Giverts was shot and six people lost their lives in Tucson, Arizona. It was at this Safeway parking lot, and for many years, a small stone memorial on the left uh, was left to not draw attention to tragedy, but instead wanted to celebrate how the good people of this area were able to overcome it. We were able to work with uh, the management company and Tohono Chul, uh, Sergio from Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum and Southwest Monarch Study came together and planted a monarch waste station at this location this previous March as a testimony to the ability of people to overcome the area. Tohono Chul is right across the road from this area and always has monarchs, so we've expanded their range as well. We're excited to be part of a monarch joint venture uh, project to create an app for monarch uh, information. The Nature Digger Monarch SOS uh, has a great app available that's free right now for iPhones and iPads. Uh, and you can identify monarchs, eggs, larvae, is it a monarch, different ways to um, ID and learn about monarchs, milkweed as well. 
And if you go to their uh, opening page, you can see under Citizen Science, Southwest Monarch Study has a link with our tagging data sheet online now, as well as reporting monarch sightings or any tagged monarchs you might see. As needed, we will share our information with others like Journey North or the Xerces Society should they um, uh, need information about monarch sightings or milkweed sightings. So we all work on this as a package together. And yes, we go back as we end this uh, talk today about how those maps have changed. We know Monarch Watch has changed their maps back in, I believe, 2011, showing the movement of monarchs through Arizona and the Southwest, and Xerces recently came out with their new map showing the same. So as new information becomes available around the United States, we all learn together about uh, the many uh, ways monarchs have adapted to our areas. And here's some information about the Southwest Monarch Study. If you'd like to read our paper that was published, there's a link on the top of our webpage for, so you can freely access it. We also made a shorter 10 key findings uh, that is linked there. And of course, any questions on our email, we have a really neat photo of pallid milkweed on our Facebook page sent in to us by uh, Tev in Nevada as well. So, uh, we use social media as much as possible to keep in touch with everyone about recent sightings. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Gail. Um, before we get to the, the question and answer, we do have a few questions for you coming in now, but before we get there, I'm going to um, take a few minutes to do some housekeeping things. Um, first, we appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise about Southwest Monarchs with us today. Um, the webinar has been recorded and, and will be available on both the National Conservation Training Center and the Monarch Joint Venture websites in the future. We will send out another follow-up email noting when it's available, and that will also include a, a follow-up survey for you to complete, sharing any feedback that you have about today's webinar or future potential webinars. Um, on that note, we do plan to have to continue our monthly series with the webinar in May, so you'll receive more details on that as soon as they're available. Um, feel free to, we're going to jump into a question and answer period at this point. If you need to, if we go over time and you need to step out, feel free to go whenever you need. And, and we may not get to all of your questions depending on how quickly they come in, but we will certainly try. So Gail, with, with that, I'm going to start off with an easy question. How can people get involved with the Southwest Monarch Study? Thank you. That is easy. I appreciate that. Um, by contacting us uh, through our webpage at swmonarchs at yahoo.com at the email, we uh, provide our tags for free for anyone in the Southwest. Um, uh, we have information on our webpage of how to tag. We should be offering a lot of workshops to do so as well. Great. Um, how about... Have you noted any differences between milkweed species available to monarchs in the area? Are there noted preferences um, or avoidances, I should say? And then as a follow-up, do you have recommendations for milkweed and nectar plant species that are commercially available and relatively easy to establish in either garden or natural area settings? Is there any particular state that is involved? Because they vary across the Southwest. <laughs> um, no state was noted, but just in, in general, I guess, if there are any, any notes that you could make. Sure, sure. In Arizona, um, the ones that we mentioned um, in the webinar would be helpful. In the lower deserts, Asclepias subulata, desert milkweed. Um, in the higher elevations, it's uh, Asclepias subvertis salata. I can recommend, uh, in general, for the southwest, on our website, we have a link that's called Plant Nurseries. If you go to that link, it's divided by states and by locations. If you know of areas that have milkweed that would like to be added to that link, have them contact us and we're happy to do so. Uh, we also have a link on our website called uh, Monarch Waste Stations. And if you look at that link, it describes the needs of monarchs here in the southwest. And at the bottom, there's suggested plantings for different elevations. Great. 
how did you build relationships with the ranchers that you've been working with? <laughs> Very carefully, right. Um, it took a long time of visiting ranchers, talking to them, um, supporting what they're doing. Um, it's a long-term effort. Uh, they depend on the cattle for their livelihood in many locations. There isn't any other source of income. So how do we develop a relationship with them is always a little bit of a challenge. It, it's by being friends with them, of trying to work alongside of them for the common goal of how do we support you in what you're doing, but at the same time, how do we help this treasure that you have in your in your uh, ranch area of monarchs coming to visit on a regular um uh, pattern. A lot of times it's taking them out in the field with you, inviting them, can I show you what we see? Um, and so they don't feel threatened that we're trying to take the land away from them um, in any way. I think that's always a major concern that I hear in the area. Thanks. Building relationships is, is very important. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to attempt to name the species, but Someone noted that you noticed a non-Asclepius species that was used by monarchs. Could you expand on that and maybe talk about if that's an, if you feel it's an important source for monarchs in, in the southwest? If it isn't an Asclepius one, I'm thinking it's one of the vining milkweeds. And we yeah. have... Yeah. Yep. yeah. <laughs> there's, I think there's two or three species here in Arizona, and some of them do use... Um, them. Um, I know in southeast Arizona, Jim Brock reported um, monarchs larvae on vining milkweed. Is it their first choice? Usually not, but it still happens, so it's used to a minor degree. I can tell you that the vining milkweeds are used very heavily as nectar. Uh, we will see monarchs feeding on them everywhere. Um, so that is an important thing to consider as well. Sure. Um, the next question was about OE testing, and I can answer this as well, but I'll pass it off to you. Could you expand on how OE testing works? The, the question was um, surrounding, does it harm the monarchs? Does, do they have to be sacrificed? So could you just expand a little bit on what OE testing involves? Sure. First of all, I think I'd like to just refer everyone to look at the Monarch Health website. They do an excellent, excellent job. They have a video, I believe, available now as well. And no, it does not harm the monarchs. Um, it is a simple test of using uh, uh, something like a, a scotch tape to uh, press against the abdomen to get some of the cells off, um, and then you release them. Um, there is no harm. I've never seen a monarch harmed by it. I can tell you, oftentimes we will use the OE testing right after we tag a monarch since we already have them in our hands. Frequently, we could put a monarch right back on a flower like a thistle or a sunflower. They won't even fly away. They'll continue feeding. Hmm. Um, okay, moving on to our next question. Do you know of any states within your study region that prohibit growing milkweed in gardens, for example, like weed control acts or ordinances? In the southwest, I'm not aware of that at this time. Um, they may be there. I, they have not been reported to us as a concern at this time. I think a, a more major concern is what is going on nationally, that occasionally uh, they are just removed from roadside ditches where they're growing uh, and being sprayed because of fire concerns or other area concerns. Okay. Um, could you expand on how monarchs use thermals during their migration? There were a few questions just asking for more, more details on, on how they use thermals. The, do they prefer to fly at high elevations or what? Um, could you just expand more on, on monarchs use of thermals during their mig migratory activity? Sure. Uh, if anyone's interested, you could also ask, access David uh, Gibo's papers. A lot of them are available online right now. Uh, they were written quite a while ago, but they still offer interesting information. When it's hot, monarchs, monarchs will try. It's, it, let me take a step back. It's warm in Arizona, 
And during the migration, monarchs need to move a long distance. Uh, by joining a thermal, they can move further, faster. They do not need to flap their wings as fast. They can save energy reservoirs. Um, we actually saw this happen. Uh, I was in uh, Camp Verde with Lisa. We were uh, talking about monarchs in the field. We had just had a group of people there. They left, and a monarch shot off of a tree to a, a left of me and went on a sh It was just like a plane taking off. And she looked at me, Lisa looked at me, and she said, this is why I can't always catch him to tag him. And we kind of smiled, but we watched. And this monarch was like a bullet going up at a 45-degree angle. And after a while, we saw its paws and all of a sudden start swirling and joining the hawks that were already in a thermal until it was out of sight. It was the most awesome sight to see. If monarchs can reserve some of their energy, they can fly further. And that is the main aim during the migration. When it's cool, they're not able to do that. When they'll have to use a lower flight. Uh, but when it's warm, they do take advantage of thermals when they're available. Great. Um, a question just came in about tachinid flies in the southwest. And so I'll, I'll take this small opportunity to say if you do have tachinid fly samples um, at the University of Minnesota, they're, they're with the Monarch lar Larva Monitoring Project, they are collecting tachinid fly adult samples. So if you do have those specimens of the tachinid fly parasitoid, um, the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota would be interested in those specimens. But on that note, in the Southwest, what do you see in terms of tachinid fly parasitism? Um, and do, do you see it as a problem that changes from one year to the next? or? Um, what are your thoughts on tachinid flies in the area? Yes and yes. <laughs> we do <laughs> here. Uh, we usually see them in higher uh, density in the cities uh, where they seem to be. Um, they will do the same thing that's observed in other parts of the country. Usually the first generation gets off okay, but by the second generation they've built up their population as well. I can say uh, when we have a hard freeze out here, the next year is usually better. Uh, but that being said, in southeast Arizona, which has the largest density of breeding monarchs, where you could go into a field during um, the pre-migration period and easily see 100 monarchs ready to tag, that area I have never seen tachinid. Any indication? I have never seen the white strings of tachinid down there, and I've often wondered um, if part of the reason monarchs uh, are so abundant down there is because their uh, predators are lower than the rest of the state. Interesting. Um, let me see. One more question. Are there historic records of northward spring bird, insect, or other migrations shifting westward, perhaps bringing Mexican wintering monarchs to the west? That's a great question, and you know, that was actually one of the studies we cited in our paper um, with Dr. Uh, Lincoln Brower and Bob Pyle wrote about that, that perhaps when the winds shift during the spring, do we get an influx of monarchs into this area? Um, and that's an, an interesting thing that we don't really have the full answers to. I know there was one study, and I'm forgetting the person's name, up in Washington, um, who looked at the NABA counts in the West, and he felt that there was a relationship that the monarchs in the NABA sites in the West went up the year after there would be a western shift in the spring. And they, uh, there's a belief that that perhaps recolonizes the western monarchs. Um, I don't really know. You know, we don't have a lot of documentation of that, uh, of what's happening. I can tell you, though, that we are not in sync with everyone else. Uh, when the eastern population is large, we have had low numbers here in Arizona. This last year was a great example. The, in general, the east population went up. Arizona was probably the lowest I've seen. All right. A couple years ago, when the eastern population tanked and went really low, we had one of the largest numbers of monarchs I've ever seen. I had 400 in my backyard alone. Um, so we're not always in sync, and we're not always in sync with the numbers that happened along the California coast uh, for their overwintering counts either. 
so um, it's to me it's it's just showing um, how flexible monarchs can be, and in a way that gives some hope to me that not every place is crashing at the same time, although the overall numbers are certainly lower. That's really interesting, Gail. Well, we've come to the end of our question list, so I hope that we captured everything from the chat box. I apologize if we if we by chance missed anything, but we can wrap up a few minutes early, Gail, unless you have any closing thoughts or, or um, any additional information you want to share. No, I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share the information. I'm really looking forward to being able to share over time even more from the Southwest. There's more interest. There's more activity. Uh, we constantly get more emails for more information so people can begin either tagging or monitoring or growing milkweed. Um, so I'm just grateful for the opportunity and look forward to more information. Sounds good. Thanks again, Gail, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Have a good rest of your day.